What's up everybody? I'm Tim from Timber Ridge Gifts. So this video is going to be all about wooden wicks. Now a lot of people shy away or don't use wooden wicks at all just because they think they're a lot more complicated than they actually are. But if you hang out with me for the next 9 or 10 minutes, I'll show you just how simple and easy they can actually be. Right, so first let's talk about what a wooden wick is. Uh, basically just like a regular cotton wick, it comes in two parts. You've got your wick and you've got your metal wick clip. Uh, they come pre-assembled or you can assemble them yourselves. Really not much different than our cotton wicks. And essentially there's really only two kinds of wooden wicks. You've got your single wick and your dual wick, which is also sometimes called a booster wick. Now there are a few specialty wicks like tube wicks, things like that. But for this video we're going to focus on the two basic designs. I'm going to zoom in and let you guys check them out. Here are our two variations. We've got our single wick and we've got our double wick or our booster wick, which was basically just a single wick with another wick strip glued down the center of it. And that's really as complicated as that gets. Now the next part, which usually trips people up, is learning how to size the wick. Um, basically it's going to come in three different measurements. You've got your thickness, your height, and your width. So our first measurement is the width. As you can see it comes in varying widths. I've got anywhere from a quarter inch all the way up to uh, three quarter inches. Our next measurement is the length of the wick. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's basically how tall the wick is. They're sold in different lengths so that you can adjust for the type of container that you're using. Uh, the lengths vary in price, so the longer wick is naturally more expensive than a shorter wick. So if you had a 2 inch tall container, you wouldn't want to buy an 8 inch wooden wick because you're going to trim off most of it. It's going to be wasted. So for a 2 inch container, you would want to buy a 3 inch wick rather than a 6 inch wick because it's going to be half the price. And the last measurement to concern yourself with is the thickness of the wick. It's pretty self-explanatory. That along with the width is going to determine the uh, size and strength of the flame that that wick is going to produce. Now to place our wicks is really quite simple. We don't need any type of special equipment. We're just going to take our wooden wick with the wick clip attached. We're going to add our glue dot or our hot glue, whichever you decide to use. And we're just going to line it up with the uh, center of our container. Give it a good press. And it's set and ready to go. So there's a couple advantages to using wooden wicks in your candles. Um, in my opinion, I personally think they're a lot more elegant. The candle just has a better ambience once it's lit. The wooden wicks, if you've never heard them burning, they give off like a really uh, tiny crackling sound, which can be pleasing and a good selling point to some of your customers. But the biggest advantage to us as candle makers is I don't need a wick bar. Once I've got it set, I can set it and forget it. I can hit it, knock it around, it's not going anywhere. Just one less thing I have to worry about when I'm pouring my candles. So now that we understand a little bit about our measurements and how to set the wicks, of course we still have the biggest question is which wooden wick do I use for my candle? Just like with any other wick testing, the best idea is to get yourself a good uh, sample kit. Uh, the ones from woodenwick.com I found are great. It's probably the most complete ones that I found. I believe they're $29.95 on their website and you get something like 120, 130 wicks and it's free shipping in the continental US. If you can't really beat that, it's a great kit to start with. And also on their website, they have a great wick selection guide, which is an invaluable tool when we're uh, selecting our wicks. Uh, anytime somebody's done most of the work for us, makes it that much easier for us. We can just go look it up and take advantage of the work and research that they've already put into it. Makes our job that much easier in our final testing phase. So we've got our wick sample kit. We've consulted the wick guide. It's told us exactly which one to use and 90 to 95 percent of the time that's going to be the proper size but in any testing there's so many variables that can affect that i like to try many different size wicks to ensure that i found the one that's going to perform as good as it possibly can to do that i'm going to take the one that it's uh, suggested that i use and i'm going to take the next size wick up and down from the suggested wick i'm going to turn those all into candles i'm going to test them all and see which one gives me the best results so now through the magic of tv editing i will turn this into 12 completed candles all right, now that we're all set up, let's talk about a few of the myths that are likely the cause of why some people are unsuccessful when they try to use wooden wicks. Uh, the first one's going to be that you have to double up the wicks, meaning putting two wicks in the same wick clip in the same candle. Um, certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, if the wick is properly sized, you won't need to do that, but you certainly can say you didn't have the right supplies and you needed to double up to get the proper uh, melt pool. You certainly can. In fact, the... Uh, that's why the uh, booster wicks are sold doubled up already to begin with. Um, if you are going to double up, I would suggest using a uh, booster wick. Just because it's cheaper, it's cheaper by the one wick already doubled up. 
Then to buy two wicks, uh, you're basically doubling your costs. Uh, the doubled wick or the booster wick will give you a larger and brighter flame if that's something you desire or need for that milk pool. So you certainly can double up, but you don't need to. The next myth is that you have to soak your wicks in some type of oil. A lot of people use olive oil or coconut oil. Um, not true at all. Don't do that. Trust me, you don't need it. It's a piece of wood set in fuel. It'll burn. As long as you've got it sized and trimmed properly, you don't need to do anything else to it. It'll do the rest. Uh, next myth is that the wooden wicks can only hold a fragrance load of 6%. Um, again, not true. Um, these candles are set at 12% fragrance load. You'll see when I do my test burn, they're going to burn just fine. So it can handle the uh, any type of fragrance load that a comparable cotton wick can. Uh, next myth is that you need special tools when working with these. Again, not true. You saw earlier I set it with just my hand. And when it comes time to trim these, I'm just going to use a good pair of scissors. It'll trim them great. So no special tools required. Just your hands and a pair of scissors will work just fine. And the last myth is that wooden wicks will not stay lit. Um, again, that's not true. Basically it comes down to your wick is not trimmed properly, which is the biggest problem people have when they're making and selling wooden wick candles. And is what typically drives most people away from the wooden wick uh, because they're not trimming their wicks properly. They don't have a lot of luck in testing and that creates a lot of anxiety when you're sending your candles out to people. You don't want to send out a candle to a customer that you've uh, been unsuccessful lighting. Customer gets a candle, it's not trimmed properly. They don't know that. All they know is the candle won't stay lit. Uh, they come back and complain to the maker. Causes a lot of anxiety and probably is what prevents most people from using and making wooden wick candles. And what trips people up the most is we're actually trimming the wicks a lot shorter than you would naturally think they should be. It feels more natural to leave the wick a little bit longer. Uh, it looks better and the basic concept makes sense. A longer, bigger wick is going to produce a bigger flame which is going to make for a better candle. With wooden wicks that doesn't hold true just because the flame sits on top of the wick and if it's too long the wax cannot melt and capillary up that wick and continue to feed the flame. So basically the flame on top of the wick that's too tall is just going to keep smoldering out because it can't capillary that wax up through the wick to continue to feed that flame. So a properly trimmed wooden wick candle is going to be anywhere from 1 8 of an inch to 3 16 of an inch or 3.2 millimeters to 4.8 millimeters. Let me zoom in again and show you just how small that actually is. For those of you that are unfamiliar, an eighth of an inch is going to be the distance between two of the hash marks. It's going to be the smallest measurement on this tape measure. So as you can see, not very big at all. So as you can see, probably a lot shorter than you actually thought it should be. Uh, to help yourself out, you can take an extra wick, just mark off an eighth of an inch on it. You can use that as a guide stick to measure once you've already cut, or you can line it up and mark the wick that's in your candle to ensure a proper cut there as well. Now we're just going to go ahead and trim our wicks. Again to do that just a good pair of scissors. And that's really all there is to it. We're going to go ahead and trim all these up and start our test burn. So we've got all of our wicks trimmed, we've got all of our candles set up, we've got them marked and labeled. Now we're just going to go and light them up and start our test burn. Now we're just going to wait two hours, let these all form a good melt pool, then we're going to come back and check their progress. Remember to follow all of your candle safety guidelines, especially when you're conducting a test burn with a lot of candles. Remember to not place the candles near anything that's flammable. Uh, keep the candles away from pets and children keep them away from any uh, source of wind or open draft, and never leave a burning candle unattended. And just in case something bad were to happen, I've got one of these on either side of the room. So while we're waiting on our test burn to take shape, I remember earlier I told you guys that the wooden wicks make a crackling sound. With 12 of them going, you can really hear it. So I'm going to zoom in and let you guys check that out real quick. Hopefully the camera was able to pick that up because you can really hear it here in person and it is a nice fun extra added touch to a scented candle. Alright let's quit bothering these while they do their test burn. We'll come back and check them out in two hours. So we're a couple hours in and we're ready to do our first check of our burn test. At this point all we're really looking for is that the melt pool is evenly spread across the top of the container. We want to see nothing on the top but melted wax. We don't want to see just a uh, 
a small hole of melted wax with unmelted wax around it. Which basically means that at this point our candle started to tunnel. It's not wicked properly. It's not going to work. So we want that nice even melt pool across the top. We're not checking depth yet. We're just making sure it's nice and evenly spread. Uh, let me zoom in and show you guys what I'm talking about. So we can see at this point that we've got several that are starting to underperform. Uh, like these two. They're definitely starting to tunnel. The wicks are really small. It looks like they're about to choke themselves out. So basically these are undersized. They're not going to work properly. So we can go and eliminate the ones that we know aren't going to work at this point. Okay, now we got rid of the underperformers. Those are most likely the ones that I stepped down from the uh, suggested wick from the wick guide. Those are the smaller sizes that I chose. So now we've got these suggested wicks and the uh, next size up. We've got some that are performing great, some that are kind of on the edge. We're going to let those go just to see how they do. And some that appear that they're going to be overperforming. Like, I don't know how well you can see it, but the... Uh, Melt pool on this one's already pretty deep. Uh, you can tell the flame is a lot higher on this one than it is the others. So this most likely is overwicked. This one might be on the edge. Uh, these two look just about right. But we're going to let them go for the uh, next two hours of the final test. See how they look when we're finished. So the first part of our testing phase is done. We've determined which ones are going to form a proper melt pool. Which ones are going to tunnel. We've eliminated the underperformers. Now we're going to go and let it go another two hours. We can actually check the depth of our milk. So the four hours is up, all of our testing is complete. We're ready to examine our milk pools and see just which wood wicks are going to work best for our candles. So what we're looking for is a nice even milk pool with no tunneling and the milk pool should be around three eighths of an inch. The first is just a visual inspection depending on what color your wax is. If this were clear wax I could see straight down into it. I went with red wax on these so it's a little bit harder to see. So one thing I can do is just take an extra wick and I can just poke it down in the wax. Now the wax is going to be soft for a good ways down. It's not going to be just, it's not going to be solid right at the bottom of the melt pool. But I can stick it down far enough and I can tell by looking at it just how big my melt pool is. So we're going to do that with all of these. So the measurement of the melt pool is the most important thing. A couple other things we can look for though. First is going to be our flame height. We don't want it like this one. This one is undersized. You can see it's just barely hanging on. It's more of a glowing ember with a small tiny flame on top. So that one's undersized. Another thing we can look for is an oversized wick. You can tell the difference in the flame height between this one and the rest of them in the line. Uh, this one's over wick. The flame is way too high. It's going to burn way too hot. to create a too big of a melt pool. The melt pool on this one was about three-fourths of an inch, which is way too big. So just judging by the flame height and the measurements I've already taken of the melt pool, I can tell this one's underperforming. It was one of those that was right on the edge. It was looked like it was going to tunnel, but I thought I'd give it a chance to see if it didn't, which in fact it did. Not real bad. It's probably never going to reach a full melt pool, but it's not that real distinct tunnel. But even so, the flame is too small. The melt pool is too small. It didn't burn all the way to the edges. So this one is undersized as well. Uh, this one again, the flame is not quite high enough. Melt pool reached around the edges, but it was very shallow. It was maybe, it was maybe 3 sixteenths of an inch, if even that. So that one's undersized as well. Now in addition to the flame height and the melt pool size, one more factor you want to look for. Really no scientific way to judge this or examine this, but basically we're just going to feel them. We're just going to feel the outside of the container. It should be warm, but not hot to the touch. This one's fine. I can touch it all day. This one's not too hot. This one's a little warmer, but it's still not what you consider hot. And this one on the end that we already know is overwicked. Definitely hot to the touch, and the heat pretty much goes all the way down the entire side of the candle. It stops maybe at a quarter inch up, but three-fourths of this candle is almost too hot to the touch. Definitely way overwicked. So we found the three that worked best for us. So now our next step is going to blow them out. I'm going to let those cool. I'm going to come back tomorrow and start doing my hot throw testing. Either one of these will probably work great but I want to find the absolute very best one. So additionally, I'm going to do some hot throw testing, see if I can determine which one of these is given off that much better of a hot throw. It may even be only fractions or percentages. But when I make my candles, I want them to be as good as I can possibly get them. So I'm going to do an additional step in my testing process to see which one of these throws the best. And that will ultimately be the wick that I go for with this particular fragrance oil wax combination. Uh, keeping in mind that if I were to change up any of the other variables that went into this candle, either my fragrance load, uh, the amount of dye I use, the wax I use, or the fragrance oil that I use, if I want that new candle to perform as good as it possibly can, I'm going to have to at least go back to this phase of the testing. I know all these wicks are going to work, give me proper melt pools. So with the new combination that I might be using, I want to make sure that that all still holds true. 
but I also want to redetermine which one of these gives off the best scent pro for that new wax and fragrance oil combination. Hope you guys enjoyed my tutorial on wooden wicks. As you can see, it's really not as complicated as it may seem or some people seem to want to try to make it. Really just understanding your measurements, understanding how to properly select the wick, and understanding how to do proper testing. And the process is really not that much more different than cotton wicks. So this can be a great addition to your candle line. Now that you guys understand it a little bit better, go out and try your hand at some wooden wick candles. Make sure you come back and let us know how it went. Make sure you guys subscribe to my channel. Hit the notification button so you'll know when I put out new videos. Thanks for watching, everybody.